Well, you may remember that the last time I was here at the Towner in Eastbourne, I was looking at the work of an unsung female artist of the 20th century, a wonderful uh, creator of collages and assemblages called Margaret Mellis. And the latest exhibition here is also about an unsung lady, in this case, uh, an extraordinary visionary collector and impresario, someone who ran an art gallery, someone who recognised painters, funded their work, worked tirelessly on their behalf. She was called Lucy Wertheim. She's really not very well known. And here to tell me more about her and her life is the curator of the show, Karen Taylor. Well, Karen, congratulations. I've had a look around the show. Um, and, and I have to say, I knew very little about Lucy Wertheim. Well, and I, it's just utterly fascinating. Most people haven't heard of Lucy Wertheim. They've heard of Peggy Gumenheim but not Lucy Wertheim, and she was very much the kind of the British female um, patron and collector and gallerist who was, you know, working in a very similar way to Guggenheim and at the same time as well. So tell me her story. Where was she born? How did she first come into contact with art? So she was born up in Manchester, lived with her family up there. Um, she was exposed to art as a young child. Her dad would always take her to the art galleries. But it was kind of very traditional what she, what she was experiencing. Um, and then her sister, Annie, married Edward Wadsworth's cousin. And this was when she was exposed to different art, to modern art, and they really kind of challenged her concept, you know, her ideas around uh, what she was looking at. So through her sister, who married Edward Wadsworth, the, I think of as no. a surrealist, he, she, she married his cousin. Yes. So therefore, they, the family came into the orbit of Edward Wadsworth, and therefore, Surrealism, Picasso, I mean, they would have been, in, as it were, infected mm. with all that by the Wadsworth clan. This is another Edward Wadsworth. She didn't actually acquire this one, but she exhibited it in her gallery, this, this work. So there's an association. And yeah. it was just kind of showing how that association followed through into what became her gallery. But before she opened her gallery, she had two encounters with other artists. So the Wadsworths, they really placed her on the path of thinking about the work that she was looking at and thinking about the work that she was collecting and widening her repertoire. Making her serious, in a way, as a collector, rather yes. than somebody, as she said, who was just collecting pictures to be restful background. Suddenly, pictures are active things in her life. Yes, so she's then searching for works that would kind of meet this criteria, as it were. And she goes to a Crystal Wood exhibition, mm. and she just absolutely falls in love with his work. So we have this painting, which has a purple crocus in the background and a black, uh, black jug and pipe in front of it. So this gives us a very good idea of what it was in Christopher Wood's work that she loved. Yes. That yeah. sort of intensity. And this really set her on that path of, of being, you know, an advocate for Christopher Wood and prolifically collecting his work. Mm. I mean, I think during her lifetime she owned about 42 Christopher Wood paintings, and which she, is she, quite a lot. She paid for him to, to, to no longer need to worry about money yes, yeah. in exchange for all the paintings he created going to her mm -hmm. to well, sell in her gallery, she, or pretty much all of them. She knew him, so this is sort of 1929, and she knew him for a year before he ended his own life. Um, but leading up to that point, they were in, they had an arrangement that she would pay him money, he could go and work, like, and not worry about, you know, paying his, his bills and his debts and his food, for his food. And, and he got, could paint. You've got, you've got a group of Christopher Wood paintings here on the far wall. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting because I, 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 I did realise from reading, you know, the, the, the catalogue that, she had a very close relationship with Wood, but it wasn't until seeing the show today and looking at the actual dates that I realised how short that relationship was. Yes, it was really and, intense. And I mean, how awful, you know, what an awful ending it was. Yeah, you know, he, yeah. didn't he commit suicide by jumping under a train at Salisbury uh, railway station? He did, indeed. So it's, yeah. you know, difficult times. So her plan was to open her gallery with an exhibition of Crystal Woods, but because of his death, that whole you know, situation then changed. Mm. And she actually opened her gallery with 
um, a show called Modern Paintings. And this room in our exhibition represents that show called Modern Paintings. And her gallery was at the back of the Royal Academy, not far from the entrance to Cork Street, where so many galleries would later be, and Leslie Waddington's gallery and so on. So she, she got premises right bang in yes. the centre of it, yeah. in the thick of it. And she's exhibiting this work, which at that time is quite cutting edge. I mean, it's, there's, there's very little market in Britain. One forgets how resistant the British were to avant-garde mm. taste. Do you remember Alfred Munnings' famous Royal Academy speech where he said if he saw Picasso coming down the street, he'd kick him up the bum and, and there were <laughs> There was very much kind of, th th that was an issue. Um, so at the time when she opened the gallery, she was an early patron to Henry Moore as well. And she exhibited this um, small terracotta sculpture in that opening exhibition. This is Henry a Henry Moore. Moore. This is a Henry Moore. Yeah. Um, but and he, Henry Moore was influenced by Picasso and by surrealism. But at that point, he wasn't the artist that we know. You know, he didn't have a reputation. She was, mm. she was experimenting with these different artists and seeing, you know, she was choosing to represent him and to be an early patron of his. Um, and yeah, then very interesting and I mean I see that the, uh, are these also representative of the kind of things that she put in that first show modern paintings yes so absolutely. she's got Matthew Smith mm -hmm. who would be is one of the few painters of that period that Francis Bacon would later say he, he took very seriously yeah he at this point was doing quite well in his career hmm. so I think um, she kind of peppered that first show with some names that she knew would to bring in the audience. Bring in that audience, yeah. but then she's also got other artists alongside them who are who are relatively unknown, like Helmut Kohle, and she discovered him in in France. Yeah, so he's a, he's um, he's he's would he, would he be an artist in the German Expressionist camp? Vaguely, I mean, what's his connection to? You know, where would he fit into the history of German modern art? <laughs> That's a I very mean, he, big question. He looks to me like it's sort of like when I look at that, I think Picasso and I think Beckman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a little bit. You definitely see Picasso's um, influence. Quite, quite powerful figure painting, and well, you think that there's a little bit of Picasso's mm -hmm. influence there. But Cedric Boris, what and Sickert, yes. Sickert, which is yeah, very Sickert interesting. Yeah, very well, well known at that point as well. Um, but in her memoir, she talks about how she bumped into Sickert on the train, uh, and then, she, well, she didn't realise it was Sickert. But then, when she went up to a, a talk in Manchester, he oh. was the speaker that she'd gone to hear. How interesting. And there's this sort of the dialogue that then comes out of that meeting. Should we should we carry on walking through and just take a little more in of the show? But